excited to feature Natasha Barlow from Birds Canada. And we're just going to give everyone kind of some house rules. If you haven't used Zoom yet before, um, you will notice that all of your cameras and audio are off. So it's just to help with our internet speeds and also for our recording, we're just trying to keep the bandwidth as low as possible. Uh, we will be recording this session and we will be posting it to Watershed Canada's YouTube page later this week. And you will all get an email about that if you have to leave at any point or if you'd like to rewatch the webinar. So I'm just going to start that now. Um, if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, either technology related or for Natasha, we just ask that you put them into the chat. Um, you won't be able to ask them audibly and we will be doing all questions for Natasha at the end, but feel free to type them in as you think of them. And then her and I will go through them all at the end. So I'm just going to Share my screen, Natasha, if you can keep letting people into the room. And we'll get started. Just one second. All right, recording has started, perfect, okay. So again, welcome everyone. We are so, so excited to have people from literally across the country to join us for this first in our webinar series. We're going to be hosting monthly webinars for this freshwater stewardship community. We're also looking to post different education resources, especially for any of you that might be teaching from home right now and just looking to supplement your uh, children's education with some outdoor resources. So uh, this is very exciting for us. We're launching it brand new this month and just looking to collaborate with lots of different environmental organizations um, so we can all work towards helping our environment and our fresh water sources. So just a quick outline of what we're going to be talking about today. We're gonna to do some introductions about our two organizations and who Natasha and I are. Then Natasha will be going over her presentation and we will do Q&A at the end and then also talk about some new resources that are going to be available after this webinar is over. So I am Monica. I was the one emailing all of you. I am the communications and fundraising coordinator at Watersheds Canada. And if you have any questions, like I said, during the presentation, you're having trouble with any audio or you have questions about the freshwater stewardship community, you're welcome to message them to me. In the chat, you'll notice that you can send it to everyone or you can scroll through and actually personally message me. So if you have any questions that maybe aren't pertinent to the whole group, you can just directly message me. If you do have any questions for Natasha, we ask that you send them to the whole group uh, because Natasha, when she is presenting, won't be able to see the chat. So she won't be able to see any private messages you send her. And if you have any questions for her, her email is up on the screen. So just an introduction to Watersheds Canada. If uh, any of you haven't heard of us before, we are a nonprofit organization based out of Perth, Ontario, which is just about an hour from Ottawa. We do uh, have the one office, but we deliver our programming across Canada. So we are a nonprofit that really focuses on giving communities and individuals resources and the tools they need to protect their lakes, rivers, and shorelines. So the first program I have highlighted on the screen is our Love Your Lake program, which is coordinated between ourselves and the Canadian Wildlife Federation. What we do is go out onto different freshwater bodies and we're assessing each property. So you can see our protocol sheet on the right. And we're really just looking at the property from the water and assessing different characteristics of it and different improvements that the homeowners might be able to make to make it more environmentally friendly. So we'll be looking at things like wildlife habitat availability, presence of invasive species, if there seem to be signs of erosion, different ways that they can improve their property. It is completely voluntary. So it's just suggestions. It's a personalized report that they receive. And then the lake or river that participated also gets a report for their whole community. So they can look at different stewardship options for their entire waterfront community. 
We also have a fish habitat uh, program. So we do three main kind of programs, two of them highlighted on the slide. In the top left, you'll see some brush bundles. So this is gathering brush and then distributing them in specific spots to restore in water habitat, which is really crucial for turtles, fish, invertebrates. And we're doing this to try and restore any brush that might have been removed from lakes to, you know, for aesthetic reasons, and we're trying to restore that habitat. And then in the bottom right is a walleye spawning bed restoration project. So we work with the community partners to find a historic spawning habitat, and then we're restoring it with fresh rock. Another one that we will be talking a bit about today is the Natural Edge Program. So this is our shoreline restoration program where we use native plants to different eco zones and we're trying to restore the habitat along the water's edge. So we use different native trees, shrubs and wildflowers like you can see on the right and we're planting those right along the shoreline to try and increase habitat availability, reduce the impacts of erosion and runoff and also protect the water quality. And then on the left you can just see one of the shorelines that we have restored through the program. And I'd also like to highlight some of our free resources that are available to you all. Uh, so we have different resources through a natural edge program where we help guide you through the planting of your own property, or if you're looking to create new shoreline habitat on your property. We also have a lake protection workbook. So this is a self-assessment tool, kind of like the Love Your Lake program, where you can just go through on your own and assess your property and any tools that you might be able to implement to improve it. And then up in the top right, it will talk about it a bit later in the presentation, but it is a new handout that Natasha and I have created in response to this webinar. And those are all available on watersheds.ca slash resources. So about the community, I think most of you should have received an email this morning, just giving you a bit of an introduction about the community, but we have just launched it this month. We are looking to connect waterfront communities and individuals across the country through any online means we can. So we're looking at webinars, education resources, and networking opportunities. And this community is possible because of very generous funding we received from the SM Blair Family Foundation. So I'm going to turn it over to Natasha in a moment, but just a bit about Natasha. So she is Bird Canada's for Real Conservation Project Specialist. The nature of her work has made her very aware of the interesting challenges that come with balancing human needs with natural resource protection. She is currently working facilitate the protection of boreal birds throughout Canada during all parts of their life cycle. She believes that by studying birds, it can allow us to rectify the disconnect between scientists and the public and provide an avenue where we can have difficult conversations about conservation that need to happen. So I will allow uh, Natasha to take the floor. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Okay, can everyone see just my screen, not my notes, how are we looking? <laughs> good on my end. Okay, great, good, good, good. Um, yeah, hi everyone, I'm Natasha Barlow. Um, as Monica said, I'm Boreal, I'm Birds Canada's Boreal Conservation Project Specialist. Thank you for having me. Thank you again to Monica for reaching out to our organization. I'm really excited to kind of do some mutual like two-way learning. I recently purchased a home with my husband that has a pond on it. And although I am new at being kind of a home and a property owner, I am a bird watcher or a birder. And so I'm hoping that we can kind of take the first step to bridge those two worlds. Some birders, they might not own, you know, large properties or some property owners might not be aware of the birds that are in their area. So I grew up near Point Pelee National Park. It's in Southern Ontario. It's a huge bird hub since it's a piece of land that kind of juts out straight into Lake Erie. It's one of the first places that birds 
be as kind of a safe haven when they're traveling across Lake Erie. But I didn't really appreciate that until I moved away. Isn't that how it always goes? Until I was in my second year of my undergraduate degree that I realized that bird watching is kind of like a scavenger hunt for these beautiful flying creatures. And you don't need to be an expert to kind of appreciate them. And then I completed my master's degree at the University of Waterloo. And now I work for Birds Canada and will forever kind of love birds. And today I will be giving kind of a general overview of why water features like wetlands, waterways, shorelines, or even anything from small ponds or bird baths in an urban setting can really provide a crucial life-saving resource for so many species that breed in what's called the boreal region in Northern Canada, especially in spring and summer. And I'll be talking about how we are connected to those birds, to the boreal region, even if we're not living in those northern regions of Canada. And I'll kind of give you a few, you know, tips or tricks on ways that we can actually be involved in their conservation. So without further ado, let's talk about wetlands, waterways, and water birds, the boreal connection. So first and foremost, what is Birds Canada? I'm not going to assume that everyone knows who we are. We recently changed our name from Bird Studies Canada to Birds Canada. So maybe you've heard of us in the past. We're also an environmental non-government nonprofit organization and we really focus on conserving wild birds through many different avenues, whether it's innovative partnerships or public engagement, whether it's sound science or on the ground action and also science-based advocacy we really strive to be Canada's voice for birds. And that includes all of your voices across the country from all backgrounds everywhere. And like Monica said, my role is to work to protect and conserve birds like this greater yellow legs on the screen that breed or live in the boreal region, this Northern region of Canada, including during their migration, this long movement, this long trek to and from their Northern breeding grounds in the spring and fall when some of these species are flying of thousands of kilometers and they're using these water features that we live near or have on our properties as they travel straight through southern on southern Canada and sometimes they're going all the way to South America which where some of these birds are right now when we're in January and it's a little bit cold outside and they are in the south. But what is the boreal? I keep saying this word, what is the boreal region? So the boreal region, it's one of the biggest biomes on earth. And a biome is a region that's categorized by the different plants and the different animals that form communities based on the different climates of the areas. So on the map, you can see the different forest regions. That red circle is where we are, and the green areas are that boreal region, that boreal forest. So the global boreal forest, it actually contains around 30% of Earth's forested area. It has more freshwater than any other biome, and it has large unmanaged tracts of forest, and it's really only spread across a few countries. And Canada is one of them. You can just visually see on the map that huge green area, how much land mass is taken up by the boreal region. That's a pretty huge amount. And since we are one of the few countries that actually has a large percentage of the global boreal region, we have a really unique opportunity to kind of experience it, but also protect it. The boreal region, it's a high latitude environment. It's characterized by shorter growing seasons. It has freezing temperatures you know, six to eight months of the year. It has extreme conditions, sometimes plentiful snow to natural disturbances like fire or insect outbreaks or wind storms. And I recently learned that the boreal was named after the Greek god Boreas, which means the god of the north wind or winter. And although I keep saying the boreal is this forest ecosystem, it is composed of these massive wetlands, lakes, um, rivers, coastlines, Canada's boreal actually contains around 25% of the world's wetlands, around 197 million acres of surface freshwater. And that's a little bit of a dated statistic, but it gives you kind of a sense of how much water is actually in this region. And we know that this region, it isn't as populated as it is in southern Canada, but in these more extreme conditions, it lies some 
unique and interesting nature and birds, which is why we're here today. So what is migration? Most people can notice the change in season from winter to spring, not only due to kind of the warming weather, but also because of the return of the gems of the sky, birds. You can think about, you know, American robins singing, it feels like spring, although robins can stay around for some of the winter as well, just kind of gets you in the mood for warmer weather. But many, many bird species, they complete this kind of biannual migration, this movement between those southern overwintering grounds and those northern um, breeding grounds in that green area or the boreal region. Hundreds of species, totaling upwards of billions of birds, travel each year to breed in that boreal region. And many of these birds, from water birds to these small little songbirds, can fly thousands of kilometers, and some are coming straight through southern Canada in this upcoming spring. So you can keep your eyes and your ears out in April and May this year in a couple months for these boreal breeding birds that are using your backyards, that are using your local natural areas as they travel. So here's a quick visual example of a bird. It doesn't actually breed in the boreal region, but it can use it as what's called stopover habitat on its way to its more northern breeding grounds. This is the red knot. There's a variety of crucial uses for this boreal region, whether it is a breeding region, whether maybe they're resident birds all year round, or things like the red knot where they're breeding, you know, in northern James Bay or even more north, and they're using that boreal as stopover habitat. This cute little shorebird, um, some, some species are actually endangered in Canada, which means that it's at risk of extinction. But you can look for that kind of rusty plumage or its clothes during its breeding season before it transitions to its more white gray clothes or plumage in the fall. So this visual data is collected between 2014 and 2016, what's called using the MODIST wildlife tracking system. So if I play this, you're gonna see individual birds that are traveling north during the breeding season, and then in the fall, they're coming back down south as well. And this is just, you know, I know this is kind of the Eastern part of Canada, but this is happening for many different species across the country. And this will happen for us in the next couple of months for shorebirds, birds that are appropriately named like the red knot because they spend a lot of time near the shore, near lakes, near wetlands, and other water birds, birds that spend the majority of the time, you know, wading or swimming, birds essentially that frequent water. So here are some other examples of birds that you can kind of keep your eyes and ears out for. Greaves on the top left, sandpipers, you know, ducks, geese, horned greaves, for example, on the top left. These are species that breed in small, shallow freshwater ponds in the north with emergent vegetation. But actually, during migration, you can see them in these larger bodies of water. Think about these larger lakes. You have sandpipers, teals on the top right, and then of course the Canada goose, which you can see in basically any habitat across the country. Water features, they come in many different forms, and hopefully you can kind of resonate with some of these photos. Maybe they look like an area, area you've visited. Maybe they look like your home. Maybe they look like um, places that you're familiar with, anything from, you know, open lakes like this one to trade wetlands or, or shorelines or swamps, marshes, which a lot of vegetation, this is out west, um, anything even from like small ponds or rivers to bird baths. We know that water provides crucial resources for humans drinking water, they filter drinking water, they help with water retention, they reduce the likelihood of floods. We also know that water provides a lot of entertainment and sports for us as well, like skipping rocks as I do not very well <laughs> in this video, but also wildlife viewing, like this adorable little muskrat. This is one of the ones, one of the six that lives um, on, on our pond. But why is water important to birds? If you think about the three things that humans need to physically survive, 
food, shelter, and water. This is equally true for birds and for other wildlife as well. So incorporating a water feature into your outdoor space, it's a really great way to attract more birds to your home, regardless of the size or type, anything from a large river to a small bird bath provides them with drinking water, bathing locations, places for them to rehydrate as they're making this long migration. But if we think about the other two crucial life-saving resources of food and shelter, water features can provide this for many species as well. So I have a question for everybody and hopefully the poll works. <laughs> so the first question is, do you like eating liver and onions? So go ahead, feel free to vote. Do you like eating liver and onions? Honestly, I've never had it. Um, I think I would try it, but I don't think I would prefer it. I don't think I would, you know, choose to, <laughs> to, you know, eat it all the time. Um, but if you never had it, take a wild guess as well. When I asked my husband, he was not a fan. Um, I can, you know, imagine my mom, if she's watching this is saying, oh, I would never try it. Um, so no judgment if people, people don't like it. So it looks like, which is unsurprising, the majority, I'm going to share these results, um, the majority of people do not like eating liver and onions, which is, you know, a little bit unsurprising. So there's not many people who like eating liver and onions, which is, you know, unsurprising. But can you imagine if everyone in the entire world only wanted to eat liver and onions every single day for every single meal? There would not be enough liver and onions to go around to support the global population. But as of right now, those of you who do enjoy liver and onions, there is plenty to go around, so kudos to you. This kind of happens in the wild as well. Many species have evolved over time to select certain things to eat and not others. So there is enough to go around. This isn't a conscious decision by any means, but it is something called resource partitioning. If all birds wanted to only eat berries, there would not be enough berries to go around and some populations would die out. Anything from little songbirds that are in the treetops or ducks in the water have different foraging or food preferences, not even preferences, just food that they have adapted to eat. So outside of kind of the obvious direct use of water, you know, bird bathing and drinking, different forms of water features provide different feeding opportunities for different species. If you look at this image and you have, you know, ducks, for example, on the left side, some ducks dive really deep to gather food. Some ducks just stay near the surface, maybe bob their head in every so often. So these diving ducks and these dabbling ducks both can get enough to eat. Some species like herons, for example, you're not going to see them swimming through these giant lakes, but you will see them along the shore looking for food. You have other species like the red knot, like we talked about earlier, these smaller shorebirds that can be much, you know, shorter than herons. And you can see them just wading through shallow water, maybe on the beach, looking for food. So not only is a diversity of representative habitat like grasslands, forests and wetlands important, but also diversity within the wetlands and water features themselves can be crucial to help birds. So bringing this back to migration, imagine if you walked from South America to Northern Canada in a couple months. You'd probably hope for great weather, a safe place to eat, maybe a place to sleep, maybe some free food, um, and a place to rehydrate. Migration is already an exhausting and it can be a dangerous journey. And we can help make this easier for many different birds by maintaining those clean water features, by conserving that diversity of water features for many different species. But when you think about water birds, you might think about things like ducks, like mallards, or, or herons, like great blue herons, or swans. But those aren't the only species that really rely on water. This is a rusty blackbird. They have experienced population declines of around 85% since the 1970s. Rusty blackbirds, in fact, they breed in that northern, in that boreal region, and they fly south in the fall to wetlands in the southeast. So if we watch their migration, I'm going to look, if you can look at this map, and you see week of the year, it says January 4th, and then JFM for January, February, March, and so on. And then if you look at the different colors on the map, the purple are areas where there's a lot of rusty blackbirds, a high abundance of that species. 
the yellow is a lower abundance. So as I play this, we're starting in January where we are right now. And then around April, they're making this big migratory trek up to that boreal region. And then in the fall, they're coming back down south, essentially touching every single province and territory before they're overwintering in the south as well. So rusty blackbirds, they rely on wooded wetlands throughout their life cycle and urban development, forestry, and wetland conversion from agriculture you know, to agriculture, it can really limit their habitat, the available habitat, and there might not be as many places left for them to go, which is why the boreal region as breeding habitat and all of the safe havens of wetlands along their migration route, like the ones potentially in your backyard, are really important in maintaining these populations. So again, we have a small pond on our property and it was amazing to see rusty blackbirds actually coming through in the fall. And it was just fantastic to kind of hear them. They have this kind of squeaky sound um, just littering the tops of the trees around our pond in the fall, which was very fantastic. But there are so many other species that rely on water features, even if you, you know, you don't think of them as typical water birds. Palm warblers on the top left, these beautiful songbirds that have that kind of rusty cap, they have like a yellowy, beigey, buffy kind of color, and they often bob their tail, which is adorable. Um, they also breed in the boreal region, but they prefer to live in areas near water. And this is also true during their migration. Before I moved to our home, I was living in Woodstock in Southern Ontario. And in April and May, I was just walking along this kind of natural area beside river. And there's a bunch of palm warblers that are on these branches foraging for insects near the water. Or you have these tree swallows or different swallows like on the bottom left. These are not exclusively boreal breeders by any means, but you can essentially see them wherever you are across Canada um, in appropriate habitat. And you can kind of watch them almost dancing in the air, often over water catching insects. Or bald eagles, these beautiful, you know, large birds of prey, they breed in forests next to large bodies of water. And I have another question for everyone. So I'm going to play two songs. And I'm, you're going to guess which one is the bald eagle. I'm going to play the first song and then I'm going to play the second song and we're going to see if this works. Okay. Let me try to share my alrighty. So this is the first song. So this is the second poll. Tell me if you think if this is a bald eagle. Okay, second song, or is this the bald eagle? Alrighty, so what do people think? Do people think that this bird of prey, this you know large um, national bird of the United States sounds a little bit more wimpy or maybe a little bit more raspy? What do people think? So these are interesting answers. I'm gonna share these results. So most people think that the bald eagle actually has that more of a wimpy song, but some people think it has the core of that, you know, that classic um, screaming song. And, both of those answers, I completely understand why you're saying that. The second one, this is actually the bald eagle. That kind of wimpy song. But often in TV shows, they will dub over a bald eagle with another bird. And that other bird is a red-tailed hawk, which is the first one, this one. So that red-tailed hawk is usually 
associated with bald eagles. I guess they want to make it seem a little bit more intimidating, <laughs> even though that's not the true sound. So I totally understand why both answers were coming in. And I've actually been seeing juvenile bald eagles even now in the winter. So you can really look for them along the shorelines, often near lakes. But moving on, you can also see birds like this, the bottom right, that common yellow throat. They inhabit this thick vegetation, often near water. And whenever I go to a place near water, whether I'm in the south or I'm in the north, I essentially expect to hear and see them along the shoreline if there's dense vegetation. And you can listen for them too. In the spring and summer, really wherever you are in Canada, unless you're in that extreme, extreme north near water. I have a song that kind of sounds like a slurred, liquidy, widgety, widgety, widgety. So I'm just going to play it. Widgety, widgety, widgety. So that's my homework for everybody. <laughs> um, try in the next couple of months when they're coming in May, try to just, if you're taking a hike or you're, you're near wetlands with some vegetation, some dense shrubbery, try to listen for that kind of upwards and downwards slurring, widgety, widgety, widgety of the common yellow throat. So why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you this because you can help. Um, you have a unique opportunity, whether you own a property with a water feature, or maybe you live in an area that has some, or maybe you're thinking of adding a pond or, or a bird bath to your yard. You can help make the journey for these birds easier from the boreal region or to the boreal region for thousands of birds, or even resident birds that are at your home year round and keep us company year round. You can experience their beauty by creating different habitat at your home while also maintaining an attractive outdoor space and conserve them at the same time, which is kind of a win-win. So if you remember this photo from earlier, this is where I live. Um, we're incredibly thankful that we're able to have some natural features, although there are definitely houses over here on the other side which you can't see. But my partner and I, we really wanted to live at least near some water feature you know, for mental health reasons, but also because we love wildlife. And this is one of the photos that he took. Um, it's a photo of a great blue heron that visited during the fall that's looking for small fish. When I look at this photo, I'm so grateful that this pond, it wasn't converted to another land use. And of course, you know, there's nothing wrong with agriculture industry. We should be very grateful and strive to, to strike a balance. But I also see a lot of lawn. I see a lot of hours of lawn mowing. I see a lot of costly maintenance because you have to baby lawns like this. So there's not a lot of wildlife habitat. So what am I going to do about this? So remember how we were just talking about common yellow throats and how they like to be near water with dense vegetation. Birds may choose specific habitat features to avoid detection from predators or from protection from the elements. So to reduce their detectability and increase their safety, if you have a water body near your property, you can provide maybe shelter in the form of planting some aquatic vegetation or clusters of shrubs or even some ground cover, which can really allow birds to move more safely across their landscape during migration and their home range while they're looking for food and they're foraging. And it can even provide sheltered habitat for birds to potentially nest or roost throughout the year. So when I look at my home, I am excited to turn this into more of a thriving diverse landscape. We are already graced by the presence of great blue herons, Canada goose, mallards, spotted sandpiper, um, belted kingfishers. Um, but I'm so excited to see how many more species we can actually see. I could maybe plant some more shrubs along the shoreline or put some more aquatic vegetation in, maybe some trees. Imagine you're in the summer and there's more trees next to the water and you're reading under the shade. Or maybe you have some wildflowers that are in bloom in the spring and summer that maybe insects or even hummingbirds can feast on. Or 
maybe some shrubs or herbaceous plants that keep their seeds or their fruit into the fall and winter so we can provide food for birds year round. What I'm really talking about is gardening for birds. If you have a water feature, if you are near a wetland, if you're near a river, or maybe you have a small bird bath in your backyard, and maybe you have an expansive lawn, you could actually consider gardening with birds in mind. Try planting species that naturally occur in your region. We call that native species. It's generally what wildlife are more accustomed to. Try planting ground cover, try planting shrubs, and also try planting taller trees to provide more of structural diversity to give birds shelter. Maybe some birds nest in the top of the trees and other birds are foraging along the ground. So by helping to provide a safe space from the ground up, you can really help birds live or pass through during their migration safely. And having vegetation surrounding water bodies on lake fronts or otherwise can reduce lawn cutting, which I am looking forward to. It can also help reduce erosion since the roots add a lot of strength to those banks, which is also true if you're on, you know, a tall shoreline, you have a lot of bluffs or a large bank as well. And as Monica mentioned, I was excited to see that Watersheds Canada has a program called That Natural Edge a program that really encourages individuals to restore natural shorelines, which is exactly aligned with what Birds Canada is talking about with gardening for birds. And the great thing is you can start small. You don't have to feel like you need to pull out all of your exotic species that may or may not become invasive, but rather just slowly incorporating more native elements into the plan for your yard or along your waterfront can actually really help birds. You don't even need a large water body to do this. You know, a small bird bath or an urban subdivision can help too. And gardening for birds, it doesn't need to be only near water features. I'm hoping to, you know, incorporate some grassland species or some forest cover to help build up that native plant diversity around my pond along the water features, but also elsewhere as well. But I don't know much about plants. <laughs> so I'm thinking, and perhaps some of you are too, how do I know what plants to choose to start gardening for birds? So I'll let you in on a little secret. Um, birds Canada, we are hoping to help provide a resource that focuses on gardening for birds and plant selections across Canada. So just stay tuned for that, it's coming. <laughs> But overall, by keeping wetlands, you know, waterways, lakes healthy, by reducing pollution, by maintaining those healthy temperature gradients, or ensuring that water bodies aren't drained is important for humans, but also for birds. But also things that you've likely heard before can help maintain water bird populations. You know, safe boating practices, watch your speeds around birds on the lake, like common loons, Please don't discard, you know, fishing line, plastic tackle, antifreeze, anything like that into the water body. It is a little hard to see, um, you know, some of these beautiful birds that are tangled in tackle or fishing line. It can directly lead to their mortality. And also just checking your boats, which I'm sure you've heard before, um, to make sure you're not transporting invasive species. Nobody likes getting their feet cut by zebra mussels, so let's try to reduce that spread. But other things to consider is participating in what's called citizen science projects. We are all citizens of the earth, so let's see if we can help. Things like loon surveys. So the Canadian Lakes Loon Survey essentially is targeted towards families, lake property owners, or even those that just, you know, frequently visit lakes for, for fishing or boating. And it really can help people take recreational activities to the next level by actively participating in conservation of birds. I think it started at around 1981 um, to track common loon, chick, hatch, and survival. Participants, they essentially dedicate three days, once in June to see if there's even loons there, once in July to see if the chicks are hatching, and then once more again in August to see if the chicks are surviving long enough to fledge. And that's really all that's required, three days just to monitor populations. Another option is the Marsh Monitoring Program. It's a wildlife monitoring program for coastal and inland marshes. If you're more confident in being able to identify water birds or even frogs, you can help survey by spending time outdoors watching your marshes throughout the seasons and the years 
while recording marsh bird observations, habitat, and, some, and in some areas, amphibian species as well. And survey information that is collected in that spring and summer helps us track their long-term trends in species diversity, and it guides anything from restoration, management practices, and conservation. And then lastly, if you're looking for more ways to use your bird identification skills for conservation action, you can check out what's called breeding bird atlases. They happen across Canada as well. Ontario and Newfoundlands is starting this year. Saskatchewan, Quebec, um, Manitoba, British Columbia have had atlases before. A breeding bird atlas essentially is a project that results in mapping the distribution and the relative abundance of breeding birds over the entire province, which, can which, which helps us track their changes over time. So those are kind of the general things that I would recommend to help keep bird diversity at your water body thriving and ways that we can kind of easily be involved in their conservation. I will also point out that I know there are a lot of bird pictures on this presentation. And if you are interested in trying to just figure out what birds are at your home, or maybe if you do start gardening for birds, you'll have more species that you've never seen before. There are so many different field guides. I grew up with the Peterson Field Guide, but Sibley's, Kaufman, Stokes, National Geographic, there are so many and many more. You can also download, it's called Merlin. It's a free application from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It can kind of help you narrow down what bird you're seeing based on your location, what it looks like, maybe what it was doing, or you can go to allaboutbirds.org just to kind of go through some species, maybe ones that we've talked about today. I know when I started learning how to identify birds, it was overwhelming. So I just had to learn to be patient with myself and kind of figure out what works for you. And there, just quickly, there are some other applications if you are interested that you can use on your smartphone or just on the web. If you're boating around your lake this summer and you see some species or maybe you're walking around your neighborhood or taking a hike near a river, you can actually record all of that data that you, those observations data on eBird. It's a free tool. You can use it on your phone. You can just log on online where you really just record those birds you're seeing and it helps track their abundances. So if you remember this map for the rusty blackbird, and if I just play it again, these are, this is eBird data. This is data that birders have collected throughout the year at different parts of the year that helps us visualize their migration. And it's really easy and it's really free and you can be a part of that. Another application is iNaturalist. It's not just for birds, it's for plants, insects, mammals. Um, you can take photos. Sometimes people help you identify what it is. I personally haven't used it extensively, but it is another option. So that's essentially it for me. Thank you for being willing to learn how and why water features provide those crucial life-saving resources for birds, including those that are making that long journey to and from that boreal breeding grounds. The water bodies that we have on our property or in our neighborhoods, they do benefit us and also birds. And an outdoor space that is good for birds, it can also be beautiful. It can easily be both for gardening for birds. If we just think about food, water, and shelter, how can we provide this for birds? How can we keep our water bodies available as habitat, rehydrating station, bathing stations for birds to help them stay for years to come? Again, feel free to check out any of these programs that I mentioned. Um, also, if you want to learn more about the boreal region or how to identify some species during migration, I did two other webinars. They're on Birds Canada's YouTube channel. You can feel free to check those out. So thank you again, Monica, for inviting Birds Canada to speak to you all today. I'd be happy to try to answer as many questions as I can. You can visit our website, birdscanada.org, or feel free to email me and stay tuned for that gardening for birds resource. I promise it is coming soon. Thanks so much. Excellent. So we thank you so much, Natasha. We do have some questions already, but if you haven't typed them in, now is the time. Um, first one is from Kristen. So she is asking if you have any apps that you recommend for learning bird calls. Ah, good question. Okay, so I'm trying to think of free ones. <laughs> the Merlin app does have 
bird songs on it, I believe as well. So that's a good option. Um, I have, I can show you, I have the Sibley app on my phone. It's $20, I believe. This is basically what it looks like, um, where it has a lot of bird songs, but for learning bird songs, there is a program, it's called Lark Wire. And it, I think there's things like quizzes, um, which might be something that would be useful if you're learning bird songs as well. So Lark Wire is usually the one that I hear recommended the most for trying to learn Okay, I see somebody, I see somebody confirming Larkwire in the chat. Um, so it seems highly recommended. So I think, I don't think it's free. I think it is paid, but it seems to be very recommended. Perfect. We have, uh, Jacob is asking if you have any resources for gardening for birds in the Vancouver area. I did suggest the Natural Edge uh, Native Plant Database. It is by EcoZone, so it's specific to your climate and will give you a full list of different uh, native trees, shrubs, and wildflowers, but just wondering if you knew of anything else. Sure, yeah, so building on that as well, um, I'm like trying not to give too much away, but also, yes, um, Birch Canada is coming out with a resource specifically for gardening for birds and other wildlife that builds on what Monica just said. It's based across Canada, in British Columbia specifically, there are many different <laughs> zones. Um, anything from, you know, your USDA hardiness zone, your kind of your cold tolerance to um, incorporates different bird regions, incorporates different gardening regions. And so that will be coming out soon. So keep an eye on our social media or on our website. It will definitely be coming out. And I would like to let everyone know that once Natasha passes on those resources, we will also email them to you. So if you don't catch them on Birds Canada's website first, we will also pass them along and they will be on the Freshwater Stewardship Community website. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> Another question from Kirsty. She's asking if you can provide examples of beneficial water features for small urban yards. Would a fountain with moving water attract more birds than a bird bath? Great question. Um, I can't say definitively if it'll attract more, but having a small fountain with running water, I think generally keeps it cleaner in the summer anyways, which is generally beneficial for birds. So what even a bird bath, like keeping it clean with a scrub brush in the summer is easier just dumping it out, um, which is, but, both of them, I, I'm trying to think, so my supervisor has, um, jealous, but quite a substantial property, and he has a running water fountain and also a bird bath, um, and both of them seem to be beneficial, but on the running water one, he seems to have a diversity of frogs. I think one time I went there and there was like 10 different frogs just sitting near this little tiny water feature with the fountain um, with that running water. So. I couldn't say definitively if it attracts, you know, one or the other more so, but both can be beneficial. So actually a really nice lead into that is uh, Jane's question. She says that she has a number of different animals visiting her bird bath. Uh, she lists squirrels and crows, different birds. She's wondering if she should be worried about disease spread. Good question. So, um, I can speak to this more in regards to bird feeders. Um, bird feeders, especially in the winter, I know in British Columbia right now, there is an outbreak in pine cyst skin, I think of salmonella. And so just because, you know, birds in the wild, they do congregate, but water features and bird feeders, for example, they kind of pull in species that are together for longer periods of time. And so it's really just important to make sure that you're cleaning both water features and also, well, I mean, not a pond, but like cleaning an artificial bird bath and also your bird feeders regularly to reduce the spread of disease because it is potentially an issue. And so just kind of being on top of that and ensuring that you are cleaning it appropriately will help reduce that risk. Perfect. Uh, I'm not sure 
you will have the answer for this, but Ed is wondering, the Loon survey was postponed this past year because of COVID, and he's just wondering if you know if it will run in 2021. Yes. Oh, good question. <laughs> yeah, that was a, uh, that was, yeah, those were hard decisions to make. Last year, everything was just moving so fast. So apologies if there's any citizen scientists on the call. We see you. We really appreciate you. You help us do what we do. Um, I'm not sure. I know there are a lot of conversations. Um, I can personally say that I was just thrown on the health and safety committee within like my first couple of months working at Birth Canada and it was chaotic just because we hadn't even met yet and then COVID happened. Um, so I can't say that definitively. I think it's just kind of a, we'll see how it goes. And um, right now, you know, unfortunately it doesn't look super promising. Um, that we're all going to be able to, you know, gather this year as we want to, but fingers crossed. So I'm sorry, I can't say definitively yet. And I have a question here from Jane. She's asking, how can citizens be effective and where can specific concerns be addressed about roaming cats, particularly in urban settings? Yes. Um, so I would just generally say, keep your cats indoors. It is safer for your cats. It is safer for the birds as well. Your cats are less likely to get a disease. They're less likely to be predated upon. And that's generally a good thing. And cats are really good at what they do, which is they're still a little bit wild and they're very good at being a predator. Um, in terms of Helping, I know, I mean, just, I don't know if there's anything you can like do specifically other than just having, you know, civil conversations and with your neighbors or whatnot. Um, when we moved in right across the street, I oh, I started seeing some feral cats on our, on our property. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I don't want this on my property. And I know, and one of my neighbors does feed the cats. And so, you know, just kind of having those conversations. I know in some jurisdictions there are, um, it's illegal to have your cat outdoors without a leash or a harness on. Um, so if it's something you're really, really concerned about, there are some, I guess, legal opportunities you can take, but I, I guess just generally recommend just kind of having those conversations. Education is key and just meeting people where they are and trying to understand different perspectives. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but that's generally what I try to do. <laughs> Some people have asked for your contact information. So I've just popped our two emails into the chat. And as well, I'm just putting in a link for a very short evaluation survey. So Natasha and I, uh, this is our first webinar of the community. So we would really appreciate your feedback. It's really simple, anonymous, just letting us know how the content was and also the timing of the webinars. So we, we picked a, an afternoon, but maybe that's not the best time for people. So if you could fill that in, that would be great. I think we have time for just a few more. Uh, Beverly is asking for suggestions on how to prevent birds from flying into windows. Right, great question. So um, there is an organization that's called FLAP, the Fatal Light Awareness Program. Um, there's also local organizations. There's some in Ottawa and all over. The University of British Columbia did an amazing, um, I wish I had photos of it right now, but they essentially took oil-based Sharpies for like $20. I have them. I should have them. They're like very, I know I have them around. Alas, that's okay. And these oil-based Sharpies, they basically just drew these beautiful murals on the outside of the windows. And so in a really, really effective way, if the lines are less than five centimeters apart to kind of break up the reflection of those windows and also making sure that it doesn't look like birds can fly through the windows, whether you have plants on the other sides, but also feather friendly is a great way to help their products are really great ways to reduce window collisions the ones that you might see most often are dots that are placed less than five centimeters apart again it's just breaking up that reflection 
I mean, I walk into glass doors. I'm sure we've all at least walked into a glass door or know someone who has. So imagine that you're, it's nighttime and you're flying and there's light pollution everywhere and you get disoriented. So regulating your lighting and applying treatments to windows if you can. Um, there are very inexpensive options like that Sharpie, um, all the way up to the more expensive options like um, like dots on the windows are really effective. If you do buy decals, they have to be placed on the outside of the window in a pretty abundant, um, not abundant um, pattern, um, essentially just to break up that reflection as well. So check out Feather Friendly, check out the Fatal Light Awareness Program, check out BirthsCanada.org. We do all have some information there um, or feel free to email me. I'm happy to provide more content on that as well. Perfect. There's one from Teresa. She's wondering about the importance of leaving dead trees near the shoreline. She has noticed warblers, belted kingfishers, and many other birds using these trees, but her local park has just removed them. Yeah. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but speaking about shelter, a lot of birds like hooded warblers that used to be listed as um, on, on Canada's species at risk list, um, or species like sparrows, brush piles can really add um, shelter for these birds to nest under. It can also, like even things like leaf litter, natural mulch for your lawn. And so brush piles, can be very, very effective and important shelter habitat for birds, like you said. Um, I know that they also can potentially reduce or increase the risk of fire. So there is that balance that we have to strike as well. Um, but yes, brush piles and things that aren't as heavily manicured, we'll say, um, can be very beneficial and provide shelter for birds. Perfect. I think there's just one more left uh, from Diane. Can more education be done on behalf of eBird on light pollution, especially for migrating birds? Yeah, so light pollution is an interesting topic. Um, where I'm from in very southwestern Ontario, there is a, it's a huge agriculture, a huge greenhouse um, production, and municipalities have been trying to incorporate um, kind of regulations on how the lights are filtered. Um, not like I, there, there is education, there is a lot of research on it already, but I guess the, you know, municipal will is hard to advance. So, you know, just having people, I guess, being aware of it or having those conversations with your local politicians about things that you care about might actually benefit um, the birds as well. If you're like, hey, I see greenhouses that are lighting up the night sky. I know, um, you know, a little bit of a touchy subject, but at um, the Twin Towers, as a memorial, there is lights there. Um, and so there is some, you know, um, we have to strike a balance for there as well because if you watch a movie it's called the messenger they do talk about that a little bit as well um, but hopefully we can we can all educate each other and have those conversations um because it is it is an issue so i can't say you know right now like we're gonna launch a huge campaign of um light pollution but it is something that we all need to be considerate of even in our own homes as well which will tie back to window collisions as well and kind of reduce that all right so in our last uh moment here we're just going to kind of share the handout that Natasha and I created. So it is now available on the Freshwater Stewardship website and is just outlining kind of what Natasha talked about and the different initiatives that you can get involved with. Uh, like I said, I will also be sending an email around with some of the different programs and books that Natasha has talked about and recommended. So if you're trying to scribble down notes fiercely from the chat, don't worry, we will be passing along. We're trying to create as uh, much of a community as we can and share those resources. 
And the last thing that I will share is just our next webinar in a series is going to be with the organization Water Rangers. And that will be on Wednesday, February 24th at 2 p.m. Registration is now open on our website and they will be talking about their water testing equipment that they have available and also the importance of nature groups, uh, especially lake associations, education groups, families, getting out on the water and making citizen science data collection a part of your summer. So we look forward to seeing all of you for that. I would just like to thank Natasha again for joining us. Thank you all for joining us. And as uh, we said, if you have any questions for us, please feel free to email. If you have questions about birds, those should go to Natasha. But if you have suggestions on what should go in this community over the next year, people you would like to hear from or organizations, please let me know. It would be wonderful to connect with all of you and try and help each other out in this very weird time and make sure that we can still connect with nature. So I think that is all. I look forward to our email in the next week or so with all these resources and a recording of this webinar. And thank you so much for joining. Thanks everyone, Miigwech. Have a good night or day, wherever you are. <laughs>